at the moment in a very different situation confronting Abbott to the situation under Howard. During the Howard government, we had quite early in the Howard reign a cavalcade to Canberra in 1996 of around 30,000 unionists in response to a horror budget. But that's something that the conservative wing of the union bureaucracy doesn't want us to uh, engage in again because the crowd actually got out of control and um, we bust into the, um, through the doors of Parliament House. Well, some people managed to bust in, others didn't, but um, they closed the doors on us. And the ACTU kept on apologising and apologising for this demonstration rather than the breaking loose into the Parliament House rather than drawing attention to the fact that Howard's budget would have done a lot more damage than what happened to the doors of Parliament House. Then Howard changed the IR laws, the industrial relations laws with the Workplace Relations Act, which resulted in quite a lot of protests all over the country. Uh, but importantly in Victoria, a number of unions defied the act to take illegal industrial action after being ordered to stop by the courts. And the AMW leadership in Victoria at the time simply filed the fines in their drawers, and uh, the drawers of their desks and didn't pay. Um, and at that stage, the bosses, particularly in the building industry, were not prepared to spend big money to smash the construction unions in the way that um, Corrigan did um, in sm trying to smash the wharfies in 1998. So the Howard government, you know, the bosses wanted the government to act. They wanted the government to take the initiative against the unions. So then Howard complied by introducing the Work Choices Act um, so that the government could initiate actions against unions and not wait for the bosses that had ideological zeal against unions. Under Work Choices, we had a number of nationwide mobilisations and strikes and they were possibly the biggest workers' mobilisations we've had in Australia, or at least the biggest in many decades, with some reaching over half a million workers, including in many regional centres around Australia, um, getting figures of 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000. But the dominant wing of the union movement at that time, including the ACTU and Greg Crombay, opposed having any protests against work choices at the beginning of that campaign. Uh, they argued that instead unions should be focusing on a marginal seats campaign in the lead up to the next election, which you know we're hearing right now, um, that same strategy being put forward. Um, but um, in the end, they ended up being forced to back the protests against work choices because once they built up enough steam, and enough states were planning to have mass strikes, um, they actually had to come on board in order to try and maintain ALP, ACTU control over those protests. Because um, there was a risk of some of those demonstrations, you know, once people get a taste for it, actually escaping ALP political control. The left, particularly Socialist Alliance at the time, working in alliance with other union militants, played an important role in moving motions for unions um, in unions for mass mobilisations, um, finding union, uh, working within unions to um, get motions up to Labor councils, uh, winning over some Labor councils, and then eventually, and the protests spread um, nationally. Now, if we had a much more militant act, union movement, would have had a lot more mobilisations than we had. But we had probably four big mobilisations spread over a couple of years and a fifth one in Victoria. But these were protests that the ALP did not want to have. Each of the protests forced the Labor leader at the time, Kim Beasley, to make commitments. The first mass protests forced Labor to come out against work choices, which they didn't do until the first protest. The second protest forced them to come out against individual contracts. Um, now, of course, the movement wasn't strong enough and there was still too much Labor domination to prevent um, the ALP from taking control and actually uh, following through on their commitments when they were in government. Uh, so they introduced Work Choices Light via the Fair Work Act. And as Diane said, you know, strikes, you know, still very low. They kept the... Um, they kept the key anti-union laws and just reformed, repealed some, some of the small worst elements.
Well, now when we're facing the Abbott government, there isn't the same responsiveness from unions that there was then, at least in Victoria. And some of the Victorian unions that played a big role in that campaign for mass protests against work choices and winning over other unions and other state TLCs to uh, support the mass mobilisations have been pulled much more into an ALP framework and are not showing any signs of resistance at this stage. The election of the, Howard, of the Abbott government, I keep calling it Howard, um, in September has signalled a real intensification on, of attacks on workers' rights, the public sector jobs and what remains of the social wage in Australia. We already know that the Abbott budget is going to be a horror one. It needs to be resisted. By rights, the union movement should have been planning mass protests against the budget and in the lead up to the budget already for several months because we know all the signs are there, there have been enough leaks to actually build big protests. And March in March, as Diane said, was, was um, testimony for that. You know, this was called by a group of people via social media and a very closed little narrow committees, but it really struck a chord. The government at the moment is preparing its arguments in the hope it can win acceptance that there's no alternative to the cuts from a section of the working class. So in order to have mass resistance, we also have to be able to nail them on their arguments. Because we live in a capitalist democracy and not a dictatorship, the ruling class needs to win a certain level of support and acquiescence from a section of the working class to, um, for, in order to be able to carry out its neoliberal agenda. And that's much easier if the unions aren't mobilising in large numbers. Um, they don't need to win over the whole of the working class, just demoralise enough workers to think that there's no alternative to the cuts, we have to pull our belts in, blah, blah, blah. So that's why March in March was so important, and that's why they didn't give March in March publicity <coughs> in the media, because they don't want people to catch on, they don't want people to mobilise, they didn't want March in March to inspire other people who didn't know about March in March to also join the next protest. Um, and also the other thing which was very obvious in March in March was there weren't a lot of illusions in Labor and I think that's especially because I think one of the dominating issues I felt, at least in Melbourne, um, was the dominating issue that people brought handmade placards around was refugee rights where Labor is clearly culp just as culpable as the Liberals. So the arguments that Abbott is using to win acceptance for the cuts, well firstly the one that they all use, mandate, we have a mandate. Well, they don't. They never announce most of the cuts before, during the election campaign. Secondly, the one they always use, that the previous government left a big hole in the budget, and there are all sorts of dubious um, budgetary accounting for this. Then the Audit Commission, which is quite smart, and this is the process they used in Queensland under the Campbell-Newman government to justify the cuts. And it will be kept secret until after the budget. And this will, um, they've got commissioned about 40 reviews, Productivity Commission reviews, and these will be used to really try and bamboozle people into accepting there's a justification for, um, for the cuts. Then the end of the age of entitlement, and actually it was quite clever of Abbott, I must say, to um, not only say that um, end of age of entitlement for working class people, but also for big corporations by not bailing out SPC and the car companies. So that was quite smart, because actually they're still giving plenty of age of entitlement to the big corporations, but a lot of that goes unreported, or we don't even know about it. It's hard to find out information about the vast extent of corporate handouts. It's very hard to get your hands on that information. But by refusing to bail out these particular manufacturing companies, they created the impression that they're being even-handed about the age of entitlement. Then union corruption and the Royal Commission, and this is also quite clever for Abbott because he knows that Howard's full-on assault with work choices failed because Howard was voted out because of work choices. Uh, and because of the mass protests and so forth against work choices, which really undercut Howard's arguments. So, you know, the use of corruption and use of ABC and Fairfax to, um, you know, as the uh, organisations, the media organisations to reveal the corruption and 
you know, and there is corruption in the union movement. Obviously, in the HSU, you know, there's appalling practices between the two right wing factions of the Labor Party that are vying for control of that union. Um, but you know, it's clear that the state um, wants to use this to muzzle unions, to prevent unions from having strike funds, and stop unions. Um, funding the ALP. Now, I'm not so concerned about the last one. They shouldn't be giving money for the ALP. But strike funds are really important, and you need, and, and that they can't be public. I mean, the real issue with um, our unions is to democratise the unions. We don't want state intervention. We need democratisation of the unions so that uh, corrupt officials, um, not just corrupt officials, but also uh, union officials that are holding back um, a fight um, aren't able to get away with that. Um, the Royal Commission, it's also very tellingly that the Royal Commission won't accept any allegations of corruption by bosses unless it's tied to uh, allegations against unions. So, you know, given that most of the corruption in the construction industry is from the bosses, um, then, um, you know, that's um, very telling. And at the moment, we have, and, and so this is designed to really muddy the water because a lot of workers have had no contact with unions, uh, let alone contact with good unions that do mobilise their members. Then there's the cutting red and green tape, which really is deregulation and cutting social protection. So, you know, we know that, you know, over the years there have been various food scares, salmonella scares because self-regulation works so beautifully in protecting our health and, and all sorts of things. Um, then lastly is the use of unemployment to bludgeon people into accepting terrible developments and this is what will be used in Melbourne to justify the building of this disastrous east-west um, link road, tunnel, road, um, road link for Lindsay Fox. Um, Okay, um, so the first targets of the Abbott government, um, so the immediate targets, okay, refugees, you know, um, there's the boat Tobax, continuation of PNG deal, keeping ASIO refugees locked up now five years or more, uh, expansion of um, offshore processing, temporary protection visas, denial of legal aid and right to appeal rejections looking to Cambodia to host um, detention centres for Australia. But also, I think probably the next major attack will be mass deportations of asylum seekers on bridging visas who have their cases rejected under dubious process and then won't be allowed to you access legal aid. Then on the environment, we've had the dismantling of a whole lot of um, measures to tackle climate change including the carbon tax. Now, Socialist Alliance doesn't support the carbon tax. We don't think that is effective in uh, dealing with climate change. But Abbott was, is, has been quick to dismantle all of the climate mechanisms and trying to rebrand coal seam gas in some new, nicer-sounding nicer name. But really, if you read the financial press, the big corporations all over the world, including in Australia, are slavering over the potential profits from uh, coal seam gas and unconventional gas. This is a huge issue for the big corporations all over the planet, uh, especially as the easily accessible um, oil and so forth has al already been tapped and so they need to tap into inaccessible and more dangerous and more environmentally dangerous um, oil and, and gas. With workers, it's reducing the minimum wage, cutting penalty rates, putting federal police on building sites while they prepare to get legislation in place to bring back the Australian Building and Construction Com Commission and the Royal Commission. Thousands of cuts to public service jobs, um, cuts to Aboriginal legal services and school truancy programs where parents will lose welfare rights if um, their kids don't go to school. Um, keeping Labor's cuts to universities and removing so-called left-wing bias from school curriculum. Um, transport, so funding road infrastructure projects in quite a few states at the moment um, at the expense of public transport. Then with welfare, a whole lot of attacks. It seems that they may have backed off some of their attacks on the aged pension, but, you know, who knows? I mean, that might have been just a bit of a way of testing the waters for that one. But there are already a lot of attacks on 
youth allowance, new start, um, they'll keep the single parents payment uh, cuts um, and also um, you know, planning a range of cuts. Refusal to extend funding to homelessness and other social services beyond June. Um, so there's no guarantee of a whole lot of social programs and the cutting of family court services. Um, the Audit Commission targets include Medicare, um, privatisation of ABC and SBS and Australia Post, the merging of Australia Post with Centrelink and uh, privatisation of health services. And another one which I think is very important, which I don't think they intend to move on in this term of parliament, but I think we have to be very alert to, is they want to increase the goods and services tax. And they're using this spurious argument that income tax hurts people on low incomes, but they don't mention anything about corporate taxes. And really it will be the left that will um, have to take up the issue of corporate taxes. Um, uh, that's unlikely to happen from any other quarter. Um, just a couple of points, a few points on the economic context that we're in. So Australia's economic growth has slowed to 2.8% and we know about the closure of manufacturing and the fact that the mines have moved out of construction phase into exporting commodities. We've got a level of indebtedness amongst Australian households. Um, the household debt to income ratio is 149% as of December 2013. This is an increase from 25% in 1976. So that means Australian workers are very vulnerable to any increase in unemployment rates, interest rates in increases or reductions in wages. Um, unemployment in Australia now is at the level of the um, global financial crisis. Um, the minimum wage is now just 43% of the average full-time wages, down from 60% um, 20 years ago. And that's just a few stats, maybe just one last one on housing prices. So the minimum wage has increased less than double in the last 20 years, compared to a 250% increase in housing prices. So this, in ca I mean, there are more stats I could read out, but this just gives an indication that a lot of Australians are very vulnerable at the, at the moment, which also is another thing that's behind some of the anti-refugee sentiment. Um, has there been a shift to the right electorally? Well, I think if you leave aside the refugee issue where there has been a shift to the right, I think really what we've seen is a disenchantment in Australian politics rather than a rightward shift. I think the federal election results showed a vote against Labor rather than a vote for the coalition because the coalition's primary vote only rose 1.9%. And I think the vote for the Clive Palmer party is really a result of disillusionment plus money to promote himself. But like in the lead up to the federal election, he said th populist things like $150 a week increase in the age pension and stuff like that. So it's, I don't think all of the vote for um, Palmer is um, necessarily a right wing vote. It's not a left wing vote, but it's a, it's a disillusioned vote. Potential for mass resistance against the Abbott agenda. This is really, really critical for us to work on now. Um, we need a ma mass mobilisations and mass resistance of all sorts to destroy the credibility of the arguments being used in favour of the cuts. Um, the March in March, unfortunately, now March in March in uh, some cities is planning a March in May, and that's actually very positive. In Melbourne, unfortunately, the committee here, and this is the problem with these secret closed committees, has resisted a march in May. Um, but there is a plan for a National Day of Action. Um, they've renamed it March Australia on the 31st of August. And I think we do need to orient to that and build in contingents, big contingents from unions, refugee movement, all sorts of movements. Um, the refugee movement, this is building up into a mass movement. There are larger protests have been happening, first in response to Rudd's PNG deal, then in response to the murder of Reza Bharati, and then the big turnout for Palm Sunday marches, the get up candlelight vigils. 
these have been quite massive, and then the Sydney blockade to stop the transfers. Um, we, and there are also lots of spontaneous initiatives well beyond the left in the refugee movement. And I think this is a really critical movement. It's also critical to fight the cuts because this is a movement that we need to win so that we can have social solidarity. Um, so the enemies, so that we can point the finger at who the enemy is. But the refugee movement needs to go in hand in hand with broader resistance against the cuts because you need a broader resistance against the cuts to point the finger clearly at who is the enemy. It's not refugees, it's the, the capitalist class and, and these um, capitalist parties in parliament. Um, the union resistance, I, I've got the wind up, I'll just sort of wind up now. The union resistance isn't evident yet. It will have to be built and the left needs to play an important role in building that within the unions because the unions are still far too dominated by the ALP and that's a major roadblock. The ALP is a roadblock against the unions uh, resisting the austerity measures. And the left influence within the unions is quite small at the moment, but we have to use whatever we've got to try and build systematic campaigns. And if you look back in history, and a lot of people look back at the Clary O'Shea um, strikes and protests in 1968, but those strikes and protests were not spontaneous. They were a result of 10 years of campaigning by the communist parties of the time, moving motions in union meetings, taking petitions around union meetings, speaking at union meetings, so that by the time of the jailing of Clary O'Shea, people knew what to do. There had been that much education. We need to rebuild the student movement. We also need to fight unemployment. And this is really important because the Labor-dominated unions don't have a solution to um, unemployment, um, especially in the closing of industries in manufacturing. And really, unless we start to repopularise the nationalisation demand, the um, fights against unemployment by the unions are likely to result in um, nationalistic and xenophobic responses of keeping up migrant workers. We need to re build the nationalisation demand but trying to build a case for why this or that industry or plant needs to be nationalised to save jobs. Um, and, okay, I'll, I'll just leave it on here. I think left unity is um, really important for us in this process. And while the left unity failed last year, I think we need to work towards maximising left unity both between the far left organisations but also with people, uh, left activists, who may not be in any, uh, any left organisation. So I'll just leave it there. There are a few things I couldn't say, but anyway, I'll leave it to discussion.